Good evening. I call this meeting of the Williamsburg James City County School Board to order. May I please have a motion to certify closed session? Madam Chair, I certify that to the best of each member's knowledge, the Williamsburg James City County School Board, while in closed session, discussed only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements as stated in Virginia law, and that only public, such public matters as were identified in the motion convening that closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered. Thank you, Ms. Elby. May I have a second, please? Second. Thank you. Uh, it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? If not, Ms. Serza, will you call the roll, please? Ms. Hummel. Here. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Aye. Sorry. Ms. Ownby. Aye. Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Closed session has been certified. Next up on the agenda is a public hearing on the fiscal year 2019 operating budget, which people are, uh, citizens are welcome to come and comment. <clears throat> so I will open the public hearing and ask Ms. Hummel to please read speaker instructions. To find them, sorry. I'm trying to find them here. Sorry. I'm just trying to find my, here it is. Here, I got it. Um, this is the time when citizens who have submitted speaker cards are invited to address the board. Speakers are asked to come to the podium when their names are called, state their name for the record, and direct their comments to the chair of the board. Each speaker is allocated three minutes. Time cannot be yielded to another speaker. Personnel matters are not discussed in open school board meetings, and we ask that you refrain from making reference to specific individuals. The board is interested in hearing all comments fully and requests that citizens refrain from verbal outbursts, applause, or any other type of demonstration. Although the board does not respond to, to comments at this time, <coughs> please know that we are listening and we appreciate your time. Thank you for adhering to these guidelines. Madam Chair, my directions are concluded. Thank you, Ms. Hummel. Ms. Uh, our first speaker tonight is Richard Long. How's everyone doing tonight? Um, I'm actually going to be representing the Windsor Forest HOA board. Um, I'm going to read a statement that was, I think, previously given to the board before I came. Statement by the Windsor Forest Association Board, Williamsburg James City County School Board Meeting of January 16, 2018. The Windsor Forest Association would like to voice our concern about the continuing disparities that exist across the three high schools. The Williamsburg James City County School Board's inaction on the redistricting issue represents a missed opportunity to address these significant inequities and will instead put more resources into what is already an advantaged school. We believe that the proposal to expand capacity at Jamestown High School will result in unnecessary financial expenditures that will negatively affect all of the county's taxpayers. We request that the James City County School Board, one, seek other solutions to the overcrowding at Jamestown High School that will not waste taxpayer money, and two, address the resource disparities across the high schools by revisiting and revising the enrollment-based funding structure. The fiscal responsibility. The school board elected to spend a considerable amount of money on redistricting research, money that was wasted when the issue was tabled, and no substantive changes implemented. There is the matter of the consultants the board contracted to create high school redistricting, maps at a cost of 14,000, which were then ignored. Second, there is the waste of the flawed community redistricting survey, the validity of which was comprised when the board elected to close its prematurely. The issue now is the cost of proposed trailers to be placed at Jamestown High School, where the enrollment is expected to increase only by 20 students next year, as indicated by Dr. Heron. These temporary structures will cost over $14,000 to set up and $1,700 per month to maintain. School board members stated that five to eight trailers would be needed for eight to 10 years. Based on the figures cited by Dr. Heron in the December 12th school board meeting, this would be a cost to taxpayers of between $650,000 for five trailers for eight years and $2.19 million for eight trailers for 10 years. When there is no strategic plan for the county or plans to address significant disparities across the high schools, this appears to be money poorly spent. For these reasons, we urge the school board to reconsider the proposal to install costly trailers, absent clear plans that address all the county's high schools. The funding structure. We are concerned that an open-ended rental agreement for trailers at Jamestown High School will solidify existing enrollments at the three high schools and the corresponding allotment of resources. 
At this December 12th meeting, the school board elected to table the redistricting issue, which represents a viable way to address the resource disparities among the high schools. Without a solution, the disparities still exist. We therefore suggest an alternative solution. We urge the school board to address the imbalance in resources by revising the school funding structure. Enrollment-based funding exacerbates the inequities produced by greater numbers of affluent families zoned to one high school. We hope that the school board will reconsider these requests. We would welcome the opportunity to meet with the school board representatives to discuss these concerns. Mr. Long, and seek your time solutions is up. To these Thank issues you very much. To the benefit of the Waynesburg James City County students. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Our second speaker is Philip Kennedy. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to speak again. <coughs> I'm here to speak on my concerns on the budget and how we continue to allocate money for this IB program that we have. We allocate close to quarter million dollars every two years to James River Elementary School. And we only have data that dates back to 2014. We have no information on how much money has already been invested in this program prior to 2014 based on the FOIA request that I got and received from Williamsburg James City County Schools. So we continue to pour money into an IB program that we have not done a program evaluation to see how our elementary students from James River compare to any other students to our other schools that go on to middle school because we don't have an IB program, because the middle schools do not have an IB program. It makes no sense to continue to pour money into a program when we have not done an adequate program evaluation and we continually put more and more money to a school program that we don't know how or if it's benefiting our students in Williamsburg, James City County. But continuing to allocate close to a quarter, quarter million dollars every two years is a waste of money if we are not managing that money and seeing how that money is benefiting our students. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Our next speaker is Jennifer Beckham Mendez. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to address you this evening. My name is Jennifer Bickham Mendez. I live in James City County in Windsor Forest. Um, today, um, I will not be reading my own words, um, but instead the words of others who I feel best encapsulate the need for equity across, across the three high schools, as well as the pressing need for more minority teachers at WJCC. These are um, concerns voiced by the advocacy group, The Village, of which I'm a member. Um, another need is the need for more ESL teachers, instructors, and aides. Um, so I have two quotes. One is from a former WJCC teacher, um, and she says, I was the Spanish teacher for one of the WJCC high schools. The Hispanic students were not in my classes, but they were in my homeroom. Being Hispanic myself, I was the one that received the majority, if not all, of the Hispanic kids. Most of them were in EL, ESL classes, and they did not understand how the school system worked or were feeling lonely and afraid in the school. Also, most of them were having behavioral issues, mostly because of the lack of good communication between the school and parents and the lack of understanding between both cultures. I also function as an interpreter in the school, especially if there was a need um, to call a parent or to visit their home. I do not think that Spanish teachers or any other teacher who is fluent in a language should have to work as an interpreter. However, I think because I was Hispanic and most of the teachers and administrators were white, I made, it made me the only cultural liaison between the school and the homes of the Hispanic families. I think it is important to hire minorities in schools that serve not only as cultural liaisons but the, and role models, but also as mentors for the students. The next is a quote from a, um, a Lafayette student, a recent graduate. Um, he says, "As a junior, when I had to be bused, as uh, when I was a junior, as I when I had to be bused to Jamestown High School every day to take an AP class, it made me feel like my school wasn't as good and it wasn't as well funded. Um, it disrupted um, my time in class, and I couldn't eat lunch with my friends." I was in the band for the four years of high school, and we often had trouble raising funds. With so many more wealthy parents at Jamestown High School, they don't have to worry. We always had to go the extra mile. Um, and so I think that these uh, testimonies um, are uh, a reflection of the need for, uh, the pressing need for, to move away from enrollment-based funding to a needs-based funding structure as well as to prioritize the hiring of minority teachers, and that's why the village advocates for both of these things. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bickham Mendez. <clears throat> Kim Hunley. Good 
Good evening, Kim Hunley, president of the Local Education Association. Um, I apologize, I could not be at your budget meeting, but we were having our regular rep meeting. So I did have um, some rep representatives here, and um, they told me to make sure that our people know, um, in addition to the letter that I sent each of you about our priorities, that now that we've heard about the 3% and the possible 7% health increase, then that 2 or 3% is looking very good if we're going to have a 7% health increase, um, health insurance increase. Um, I see that uh, it's so funny that snow removal got put back on the budget. And as you remember, no offense, but uh, they were not in favor of snow removal equipment. <laughs> um, lastly, no goodies tonight. Ship is here. <laughs> so um, I did consult with them on some tips for you. So since I always leave you with some kind of tips, uh, drink plenty of water. Do not stay up late. Uh, stressing over the budget, go to bed at regular time. Take deep breaths when you get um, frustrated. And then there's a seated, potted palm exercise you can do. So you can do that while you're sitting. You go like this, up, up through here. Pull your hand to the side, look to your, over that shoulder. Come back up, down, and of course you're breathing through this. And then go to the other side. Take a breath, deep breath and back in. So goodies next time. All right. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you, Ms. Humley. <clears throat> Amy Quirk. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Amy Quirk, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, I have the distinct honor tonight to read to you a testimony from a current student. Um, who speaks powerfully to the importance of prioritizing the recruitment and retention of minority teachers in this year's budget. This is her testimony. I am currently a high school senior in Williamsburg, James City County Public Schools. I am multiracial, black, Hispanic, and Caucasian. I started my education experience in Williamsburg at what was then Rawls Bird Elementary, Penguins Forever. I never really recognized anyone who slightly resembled me. I never heard anyone speaking with a maybe Spanish accent that might be able to relate. Between kindergarten and middle school, I had one African-American teacher. I was very quiet and received good grades. In middle school, the guidance counselors weren't very quiet, or sorry, weren't very accessible, and I found out later that I had some depression and felt a lot of oppression within the classroom. I was finally able to identify with a staff member who slightly resembled me. Our hair looked similar, our skin looked similar. She worked in the cafeteria. She always checked in on me, and if I was having a rough day, she could tell, and she would talk to me. She wasn't Hispanic. In high school, I've had one teacher throughout the four years here that looked like me. She is easy to talk to when she has time. She reaches out to my mom and maintains a line of communication with her. I can say socially, I've had more issues in high school than any other school. Um, but the only people who have been around to relate to any of my issues or that look like me are security guards. I can't really share with them because they have to report everything or investigate. I just need someone who understands me at school. I mean, I've made it, but it was hard. A lot of things I could have had help with if there was just one person who understood my culture or my background or my household. Please, for the next young female passing through your system, hire more people who look like the kids colorful and ethnic, who speak languages and try to understand. Yes, I fit the statistic of a biracial child from a single parent home. My mother works hard and raises me right with morals and faith, and I made it. It is testimonies like these that demonstrate why the village advocates for equity through the recruitment and retention of minority teachers as a budget priority. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Quark. That was the um, last speaker card for the public hearing. There will be an opportunity for citizen comment later, so if your name wasn't called, um, Ms. Ombi will call it at that time. And with that, I will close the public hearing and move on to the regular meeting, with the, starting with the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, Mr. Branson, will you come up? Troy Branson, who is a freshman at Lafayette High School, will be leading us in the pledge today. He is a member of the Pilot Link 5 program. Whenever you're ready. <coughs> okay. 
I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Serza, will you call the roll now? Dr. Beers. Here. Ms. Hummel. Here. Mr. Kelly. Here. Ms. Ownby. Here. Mrs. Taylor. Here. Mrs. Young. Here. Ms. Cook. Here. Thank you. Now, may I have a motion for approval of the agenda, please? Madam Chair, I move approval of the agenda as presented tonight. Mr. Kelly, can I have a second, please? Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Serza, will you call the roll, please? Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Ombi. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Thank you. The agenda is approved. That brings us to item 5.01, announcements and superintendent's report. Dr. Heron, do you have anything interesting to share with us this evening? <laughs> I certainly do, Madam Chair. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. With the recent snowstorm, WJCC was closed five school days, and for the first five closures, banked instructional time will be counted towards the state requirement of 900 hours. However, due to the impact of closures and delays having students' success, additional time will result in some of calendar readjustments. Just to list those for you, these were sent out by uh, uh, Twitter on the web page and to parents today, but March 2nd uh, will become a full school day for all students previously on early release. These are the days that may be used with additional snow. April 19th will become a full school day <clears throat> Excuse me, for all students, it was previously an elementary uh, parent conference early release day. March 30th could become a, school, a full school day for all students. It was previously a student holiday. And the last day that may be taken will be February 19th, which may become a full stay, school day for all students. That's the President's Day holiday. That information was sent out earlier, but unfortunately, Due to uh, forecast on all major channels uh, of one to two inches of snow starting at seven o'clock in the morning and snowing throughout the day, school will be cancelled tomorrow. The timing of the snow is almost impossible to work with uh, because it's just as we're getting buses on the road to get students to school and just as student drivers are driving to school. Uh, these decisions are extremely difficult to make. They are not made easily because we want you to be at school. That, that's, that's why we're here. That's the reason we, we exist. But student safety comes first. And even though it's frustrating for families and parents and for staff and for all of us as well, we don't make any decision lightly. That's the first piece of news. Secondly, 12 WJCC high school students were recognized on Sunday, January the 14th for their outstanding academic accomplishments at the 29th annual Martin Luther King Jr. AXO Awards reception. The NAACP's AXO or Afro Academic Cultural Techno Technological and Scientific Olympics is a major initiative designed to recruit and encourage high academic and cultural, cultural achievement among African-American students. We have a list of our exceptional honorees on the website and we invite you to please go and see who those students are and congratulations to, to all of them. Finally, on, on Thursday, March 1st, from 6 to 7, there will be an information session in the James River Elementary Media Center about the school's International Baccalaureate Primary Years Program. Attendees will tour James River Elementary School and learn more about how the IB Early Years Program develops inquiring, knowledgeable, and caring young people who help create a better world through intercultural understanding and respect. For more information about the Early Years IB program, please visit the school's website. Those are all of the announcements I have this evening, Madam Chair. Thank you, Dr. Heron. Ms. Ownby? I just wanted to have a quick follow-up with regard to um, African American History Month. I know that each of our schools have a unique way of celebrating that and recognizing that, and I was wondering if you could speak to that. 
Dr. Heron? Certainly. I think Mr. Thorpe may have some things that have a couple of examples that have happened at the elementary school, and Dr. Carroll may have a couple of things that have happened at the secondary level to honor Martin Luther King's Day. All right, good morning. Uh, excuse me, good evening, Madam Chair, members, long day. Um, at DJ Montague, uh, and this is uh, in recognition of uh, African American History Month, is that correct? Um, at DJ Montague, uh, contributions of African Americans will be shared on the morning announcements. In addition, the background music for morning announcements will be comprised of African American musicians, and African American community members will read to students during guidance lesson with a theme of uh, a moral of the story. Um, at James River, River Elementary School, uh, there will be guest speakers to speak to all of the classrooms um, and feature books in the media center and during media lessons. Uh, there will be a clip about famous African Americans on the news each morning and the second grade is putting on uh, a presentation about famous African Americans as well. At Matoka Elementary School, uh, there will be a school-wide assembly, I Have a Dream, on February 21st at 10.15 a.m., and African-Americans uh, on display uh, will be displayed, famous African-Americans will be displayed on um, the showcase during the hallways, uh, decorated to reflect African-American contributions and artifacts in history. In addition, uh, there will be an African-American history reading challenge. It's titled, Read With Me. Um, and students will be doing, encouraged to read at least 28 children books that feature or celebrate the contributions of African Americans in America. And Matthew Whaley Elementary School, all Matthew Whaley students will attend the uh, Virginia uh, Repertory Theater's production of I Have a Dream on Wednesday, February 21st. Those are just, that's just a short sampling of some of the things that our elementary schools are going to be doing to celebrate African American History Month. Thank you, Mr. Thorpe. Dr. Carroll. And a, a sampling of some of the events for our secondary schools at, at uh, Berkeley Middle School. They're going to have daily facts uh, on the Bulldog News. Uh, and on a board decorated uh, in the hallway. Uh, also a writing contest uh, throughout the uh, English departments of 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. Uh, and all of Berkeley's efforts will culminate in a uh, Black History Month celebration program on February 28th that's open to the community. Uh, Hornsby Middle School, uh, daily uh, questions on, uh, based on a short bio and historical uh, information about uh, either historical or present day African American will be read by a student and uh, chances for uh, students to, uh, to win prizes based on their answers. Um, they're going to honor uh, some of the employees there, and they're going to also focus on uh, Thurgood Marshall throughout the, the month. And again, they're going to culminate in a uh, pep rally, which will have uh, different activities uh, dedicated to Black History Month also. And at War Hill High School, uh, they're going to have a school-wide event to focus on the uh, historical African-American women. Uh, including a movie viewing and panel discussion. And also they're going to connect that uh, to uh, focus on STEM careers uh, and the opportunities uh, that uh, could be present for our, our current and future students uh, in those areas. And that's just a small sampling of some of our uh, secondary uh, activities during February. Thank you, Dr. Carroll. I'm really looking forward to the Berkeley um event. Of a, it's on my calendar already. It sounds like it's going to be a lot of fun celebrating music and writing and, and all many achievements of, of African-American citizens. Can be anything else? I just wanted to uh, give two quick up committee updates. The CTE Advisory Committee met in December and reviewed the profile of a graduate and they conducted a work session on high school internships and what they should look like. SEAC did not meet in December. Um, they typically don't meet in December, so they met last week, and they are coming to consensus on bylaw, proposed bylaw changes, and the creation of uh, standard operating procedures. Any other announcements? That brings us to item 6.01, School Spotlight. Dr. Heron. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's my privilege this evening to introduce Dr. Holloman from Lafayette High School, who will present the School Spotlight this evening. Welcome. Good evening, WJCC School Board, Superintendent Dr. Heron, senior leadership, parents, and community. When you step on the campus of the Lafayette High School, home of the Rams, you can't help but feel at home. You see, it's more than a school. 
It's a place that we call home. And when you enter into our home, you cannot help but see and feel the sense of community. You feel school pride, academic excellence. What a truly amazing and special place. And what makes it so are the awesome teachers, students, staff, families, and the community. This evening, I will give you a glimpse in one of the academic wings of our picturesque mansion that sits on the hill of Long Hill Road. Through a course called Link 5, there are five awesome teachers who use a teaching method in which 48 freshman students gain knowledge and skills by working for an extended period of time to investigate and respond to an authentic, engaging, and complex question, problem, or challenge. Through the Link 5 pilot, the use of project-based learning is an action of learning through identifying real-world problems and developing solutions. Authentic engagement emerges through the project-based learning. Our students enrolled in the Link 5 course, they emerge as critical thinkers, collaborators, more than effective communicators. They're creative thinkers, and we prepare them to be ethical and global citizens. So what Link 5 did was for their first summative project, they did a project summary where students published a leadership magazine after engaging in research and collaborative class discussions on a selected historical leader to determine their leadership style and resulting in impact on society. The research process students examined were primary and secondary resources. They participated in personal leadership inventory survey. They compared their leadership abilities to historical leaders in order to write an expository essay. Our students used principles of design in conjunction with Microsoft Office, Suite Products, and Adobe InDesign. They had a driving question, and each of you do have the magazine that emerged from that. The driving question behind your magazine, Movers and Shakers, was how did historical and geophysical features shape leaders and how did they impact the world? So I want Brooke to talk to us, or are we going to start with Ann? Let Ann talk to us and show you what they did and what they learned through this journey at this amazing place. During the Leaf 5 Leadership Project, I feel as if I learned a lot, starting out with something as amazing as collaborating with my classmates. It was really fun to get to learn more about everyone else, including the different leaders that they had. I definitely wouldn't have gotten to know some pretty crazy things about their leaders if I wasn't able to collaborate with them. Another, another really cool thing that we did was InDesign. InDesign is the program that we use to put our magazine in. At first it was a little bit complicated and stressful to get it in because it would be laggy or it would crash or it wouldn't save properly or something like that. But once we had our finished project, I realized it was a really fun program to use and that I would definitely use it again. It was also really cool learning about my leader because I think a lot of people always picture leaders as someone who's just a good person. But my leader wasn't exactly that. Hernan Cortez did a lot of pretty terrible things, like wiping out all the Aztecs in Mexico and strangling his wife to death. He wasn't exactly the best guy, but yet he's still honored as a leader because he did something great, and that was to claim Mexico for Spain. So I really appreciated doing this project and learning more about different leaders and what leadership is in general. Thank you, Ms. Garys. So next, I want you to hear what Brooke had to say. The Movers and Shakers magazine project taught me a lot over the past few weeks. Um, I've learned and expanded my knowledge of leadership and collaboration with a partner or group. Um, and the programs we use, such as Adobe InDesign and Photoshop, have really helped me develop my skill in working on a magazine spread and helped me focus on the right criteria and so that I was visually pleasing for a crowd. The programs were difficult to navigate at first, but after a while, they really kind of, we really kind of learned off of them and developed new skills that helped us make the project a success. 
Um, my leader for this project was Queen Elizabeth I, and when I first received her, I wasn't really sure I was going to enjoy the project or like the person I was researching. But after my research was finished, I really found that she was an important and um, interesting individual. Um, overall, this project has helped me open my eyes to what real leadership really is, and I can't wait to see the final. Brooke, so in front of you, you do have our Movers and Shakers magazine that was actually drafted and created and produced by our Link 5 students. So starting with the end in mind and assisted and supported not only by our Link 5 staff, our students do think critically. And so you can see there how our students actually engage in their project-based learning. These are amazing Link 5 faculty in which they are supported um, each and every day. So here's what our Link 5 teachers have to say about movers and shakers. Sure, so the goal for this project was really to have students look at historical figures from the whole scope of um, World History II, which is from the Renaissance all the way up until the present, and to really go in-depth researching one of those figures um, to learn everything about their historical significance and their leadership skills, um, and then to create a professional-looking uh, magazine about them. Well, we had um, the editor of the Next Door Neighbor magazine come in, and she talked about laying out a magazine. Um, and so that was, I mean, I don't know that, that was sort of our entry yeah. event to the project. Um, the students worked in um, the four courses to create different pieces of the magazine to be brought to the table to be put together mm -hmm. into one large spread. Um, so in English, they worked on um, writing. Um, they had to um, research and understand their leadership, um, that their care, their uh, leader in history, and the um, leadership style that they had. Um, in art, they studied the principles of design, mm -hmm. um, which they applied to the magazine spread. Um, in um, computer information system, they looked at the other elements on the, on the page. So, for example, a timeline and using um, Microsoft Word and Photoshop to, to move those into InDesign and create the spread. I think our hope was that the students would um, be able to celebrate their accomplishments in the magazine to sort of um, show that to their family and, and the community, um, but to to really start to reflect on um, themselves as a leader and some of those leadership um, styles and characteristics that they studied. Um, they might not have always agreed with the leader or the leader's positions, but that they could see that the leadership um, skills, they can manifest themselves in a lot of different mm -hmm. forms. Yeah. So. And I think, like, as far as the exhibition night, you know, it's a, like we were, we were all working so hard, teachers and the students. And, you know, I kept thinking back to those videos and being like, okay, well, like, those exhibition nights are so amazing. And, like, as soon as we get there, everybody's going to be like, okay, this is why we're doing this. This is why we're working so hard. So I think that making it really special for the kids was important and it was a cool night i mean they really liked it they liked going up to talking to their parents talking to their friends parents mm -hmm. about it they like showing their their product off and um like jennifer got a red carpet for them to that walk in on um and they all had to dress up and you know just like get their magazine and have their picture mm -hmm. taken with the magazine like they were like movie stars like it was like it was really cool. you know they liked it there was a lot of connections for the students about um, what they did and the true purpose of why they were doing it. Mm -hmm. So the students made the connection of something that they were writing in English and what that product was in the end. And it was the, the, the so what to why am I doing something. Mm -hmm. and, and that was really great to see. Mm -hmm. They did um, Flipgrid reflections videos. So they talked about like what they learned about leadership and their experience in the magazine, um, and they had that ready. So that was like kind of an interactive thing. Um, so I think that kind of helped prime them to get ready to talk mm -hmm. about their work with people. And this first one was kind of a low pressure. They kind of had to show up and talk to some people about it, 
in the future, we're thinking about giving them some more ownership um, of it and some, and some more control. But this one was kind of an easy, uh, low pressure. Yeah, they just had to situation. dress up nice, show mm -hmm. up with a family member. Yeah. And we took that opportunity to kind of express to them, um, you know, professionalism um, and self representation in what you wear and how you act. And um... I feel like that's something for like everything in this program mm -hmm. like we have ideas in our mind of how things should be and we don't get that sometimes we forget um that they're just ninth graders mm -hmm. and they need to really have some kind of frame of reference to get to like the really good spot so so thank you um to our link five uh, teachers so clearly our students really consider a future path they actually create an array of opportunities that focuses their brains to think globally, um, communicate um, in a variety of settings. And so clearly you can see that our students that sit high on that mansion that, that I've told you about, that they are ready. They are able to grasp concepts. They're able to think critically. They're able to apply those learned informational skills in real world situations. But they cannot do that alone. They have great parental support they have the great support and collaboration of their peers. And so they are well equipped for success, no matter what their path or their passion. These are our Link 5 leaders. And so I'm going to ask Sam to just come up really quickly and give you a firsthand um, overview of how it's benefited him. He promised to speak less than 60 seconds. <laughs> Hi, my name is Sam Adkins, and I'm a student in the Link 5 uh, course at Lafayette. I really uh, appreciate the opportunity uh, to be here tonight and to be in the Link 5 program. I think it's taught all of the students how to be ethical leaders, and it's taught us a lot about the world and how uh, business, history, technology, art, and science and English uh, really affect um, your businesses and how you are when you're an adult. Uh, the projects that we do are a lot of fun and they teach us a lot. I think that the Leadership Magazine was a great way to show us to take pride in our work because we knew that it was going to be published and that was something that meant a lot to us and so it had to be our best work and so that's what we did. We put our best work forward and we even got to incorporate parts of what we do outside of school into the magazine, uh, like I really enjoy doing art and I did some cartoons uh, throughout the magazine and some other people drew the covers uh, and we got to organize it using, um, as they said, Adobe InDesign. And I really think that it was a great way for us to uh, take pride in our work and to show us uh, what we have to offer and uh, really how great uh, this program is and just how fun it is to learn. Uh, currently, we are working on a project, um, uh, we call it the Water Project, and we're learning about how water affects um, the world in all aspects, um, and its natural disasters, and how uh, great it is, uh, and how necessary it is to life, and we've built fountains in art class, um, we're working on some big poster boards and PowerPoints in both science and English, and that's been a lot of fun, and uh, it's been a bit of a step up from the magazine project, but it's going to be really fun to see how that uh, we pull it off, and I'm really excited to see how it looks. Um, and I think we're all putting our best work forward, and this time we have a bit more knowledge about what we're supposed to be doing and how uh, we need to present the research we've done, and we've gotten to do a lot more control on that. Um, and so I think it's a really special uh, course that is at Lafayette. And uh, it's been one of the best learning experiences I think I've had. So thank you. Right here. So I want to thank Sam because clearly you can see for me, I have a script. Um, and clearly he did not. Um, so it does tell you a lot about what we are developing um, on that place I say at 4460 Long Hill Road. Come by and visit us. But at this time, I do want to acknowledge our Link by faculty, um, if they could stand. Dan.
they're not shy. I don't know why they've been shy tonight. <laughs> uh, Link 5 students, I want to thank them. I want to thank Samuel. I definitely want to thank the Link 5 parents um, and our Link 5 community. Um, definitely for our athletic department who really did help um, us with our funding sources for our Movers and Shakers uh, magazine. Definitely our faculty and staff and WJCC school board and our central office. So thank you. Anyone have any questions or comments for Dr. Yeah. Holliman? Yeah, yeah, Dr. Beers. Um, I, 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 I am in, so impressed by Movers and Shakers. I know something about writing and I know something about publishing. And uh, this is, uh, uh, it, it's an incredible uh, publication. Um, I was checking the facts for so many of the people in here and, um, and it, uh, and the narratives are, um, you, you don't want, you want to go on to the next one. Excellent. And really, it just shows that, um, you know, we have three outstanding high schools in this, in this division. Lafayette's one of them. So I, I, I commend you and the staff. I just want to say I love the magazine. I think it's so fun flipping through. And I think I found that young man, some of his cartoons, right here. That I think you asked, but there they are. Yes. Oh, Sam had to leave because he thinks he has school oh, tomorrow. Right there. Right there. Okay. <laughs> these are yours? I like them. And also enclosed inside of the magazine, you do have their autograph by our amazing Link by faculty. So each of you have the autograph copies. You do have in your blue um, envelopes the invitation to their next summative project. Thank you. Um, so when we talk about the portrait of a graduate and all of the skills that our graduates are going to need with teamwork and collaboration, uh, being able to produce a final product that they can talk about in their college essays, they can talk about in job interviews, they have a portfolio that they can take with them, um, they're using all sorts of different skills and incorporating them all together and it's just so wonderful to see it happen in our school system so um, and yes Samuel you did a fantastic job with your cartoons as you can see I'm very proud of all of them <laughs> thank you okay. thank you Dr. Holliman and, and I'm sorry. yeah you should be very proud of them all I did, I did the word search for the past two or three so. <laughs> And I'm, I'm really, I, I've just perused some of the articles. I'm really looking forward to sitting down and reading them. So, And um, you don't have school tomorrow, so you can stay if you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And I would just like to say it's, it, was, it warmed my heart to see how engaged the students were. And so I think that's something that is exciting with project-based learning. Um, and I'm thinking about my rising freshman and how he would really um, appreciate this opportunity to be to do hands on to learn from his peers and um, to produce a, a project at the end. So I think this is great. Thank you, Dr. Holloman, and, and all of you for being here tonight. In the interest of full disclosure, my son is in the program. And, and, uh, <laughs> And quite enjoys it. It's it's really impressive, and I've read the magazine from cover to cover on more than one occasion. It's it's really quite quite good. So. And yet he's not here today. No, he's probably watching though. <laughs> so, um, with no other comments, we'll move on to citizens' comments. Um, we have two speaker cards tonight. Miss Hummel, would you like to read instructions? Sure. Okay, here I go again. This is the time when citizens who have submitted speaker cards are invited to address the board. Speakers are asked to come to the podium when their names are called, state their name for the record, and direct their comments to the chair of the board. Each speaker is allocated three minutes tonight, and time cannot be yielded to another speaker. Personnel matters are not discussed in open school board meetings, and we ask that you refrain from making any reference to specific individuals. The board is interested in hearing all comments fully and requests that citizens refrain from verbal outbursts, applause, or any other type of demonstration. Although the board does not respond to comments at this time, please know that we are listening, we appreciate your time, and thank you for adhering to these guidelines. Madam Chair, my directions are completed. Thank you, Ms. Zombie. Our first speaker is Satoshi Ito. Good evening, and I'm Satoshi Ito, and I'm a resident of James City County for a long time. 
And this has to do with why hiring and retaining minority teachers is important and is also related to equity concerns. White students can take benefiting from, uh, from equity for because they are well represented by adequate proportions of white students who are also highly qualified and share their cultural values. The village members find that the African American students in the Williamsburg, James City County classrooms experience a paucity of African American teachers in both their numbers and therefore in African American values. In summary then, these students come out short on the equity dimension. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ito. Mark Adam. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mark Adam. I'm here because I'm very upset with the Hornsby Middle School Athletic Department. I would like to know the proper protocol to lodge a formal complaint. I would also like to further understand the rules and regulations in regards to our children's safety while riding buses to and from athletic events. Thank you for your attention to this matter, and I look forward to your response. Thank you, Mr. Adam. Thank you. All right, that brings us to the consent agenda, which includes item uh, 8.01, financial report and monthly bills and payroll for November 2017. 8.02, financial report and monthly bills and payroll, December 2017. 8.03, personnel actions as presented. 8.04, resolution R-3-18, career and technical education month. 8.05, resolution R-4-18, national school counseling week. Item 8.06, resolution R-5-18, African American history month. And finally, item 8.07, revised policy BDD, electronic participation in meetings from remote, remote locations. May I have a motion, please? Madam Chair, I move approval of the consent agenda as presented. Second. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Serza, will you please call the roll? Dr. Beers. <coughs> Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Ombi. Aye. Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Consent agenda passes. That brings us to item 9.01, WJCC Schools Foundation Donation for Innovative Learning Grants. I'm going to hand this over to Dr. Heron and Ms. Hummel to introduce the next presenter. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's my pleasure this evening to introduce Mr. Clarence Wilson, um, who's president of the WJC Schools Foundation. And he is here today, tonight, to give us uh, some information about grants this year. But just before he speaks, I do want to say it's an incredible privilege that I have to work with the Foundation <coughs> members. They are an incredible group of volunteers. They have given en endless hours uh, and can, can't do enough for our school system. Their work has brought innovation into classrooms across WJCC and I'm incredibly grateful to the foundation for their work and also to the community at large for their support of the foundation. Um, yes, I, I actually have been involved in as the school board representative on this board uh, for the past two years and uh, I just wanted to let everyone in the community know that we've got about I think 52 volunteers that work throughout the year with the Community um, Grants Foundation. So um, they do all sorts of things. They, they work tirelessly to do the grant award ceremonies at the high schools. They select the grants. They uh, plan special fundraising events and including the parade, the Christmas parade this past year. So it's just been a a wonderful community organization of retired people, of people that have kids in the school system, uh, people that don't have kids in the school system that just want to give back. And I just wanted to say it's been an honor working with uh, Clarence and the rest of his his uh, foundation these last two years. 
Mr. Wilson, before you begin, I was so excited about this agenda item that I forgot to ask for a motion. So let me take the time to do that, and then I'll toss it to you. May I have a motion um, for item 9.01, please? Madam Chair, I move approval of WJCC Schools Foundation donation for innovative learning grants in the amount of $39,833. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Second. Be. Mr. Wilson, thanks. Thank you. I think you've said it all. <laughs> uh, Madam Chair, members of the school board, uh, my name is Clarence Wilson. I have the honor of being president of the WJCC Schools Foundation Board of Directors. My purpose here tonight is that uh, for each uh, grant cycle, the foundation makes a donation to the school division to cover the cost of learning grants to be uh, uh, awarded to staff members of the uh, school division for that particular cycle. Uh, the foundation is pleased to announce a donation of $39,833 to the school division to fund 27 innovative learning grants for 45 division staff members spread over 14 schools. The grants will be awarded uh, to recipients on Friday, February 2nd, and our kickoff uh, will be at, I now learn, the Lafayette High School uh, <laughs> on the 2nd. Over the three years since the foundation was established, 69 grants have been awarded to support innovation in our classrooms totaling $97,233. 109 staff members have received grants, and over 75% of the students in the division have benefited from these grants. Feedback from the division staff has been overwhelmingly positive, and we have witnessed some truly creative ideas being brought to the classroom. It is certainly true in this case a little money goes a long way. And we're just getting started. We exceeded our fundraising goals last year by almost 15% and importantly increased the number of new donors significantly. We are on track to fulfill the mission set by your board to bring the community together to provide resources to support innovation in our schools. If we can imagine a time when students are enjoying the benefits of has, having dozens of innovative ideas working in this classroom, all funded by the WJCC Schools Foundation. To meet this challenge, the board continues to focus on building capacity and sustainability in three areas. The first is we must continue to build a diverse and strong board. Uh, our board is very committed and very hands-on out of necessity due to limited staff support. As a result, we depend on board members to have working skills in key areas such as development, marketing, finance, and programs. It is critical that we continue attracting board members with a broad diversity of skills and approaches to problem solving who don't mind the hands-on approach that will be required for the foundation's success. We are pleased to have Mrs. Humble and Dr. Heron as very involved members of our board. The second area is donor cultivation. We have a goal of building our donor base to about 1,500 active households, and we're well on the way to achieving that goal. We'll focus on building a stronger support from parents uh, in the business community through targeted events and appeals. It was mentioned we participated in the parade for the first time this year, and we are uh, building a business uh, forum where we have already attracted support from several businesses. Last year, 212 members of the community made donations to support the foundation. That is up by uh, over 20% from the previous year. So support is growing. Our best spokespersons continue to be grant winners. Donors have been so impressed by their ideas and strong commitment to student learning. We take every opportunity to get grant winners before potential donors, and it has been extremely successful. The third area that we must uh, focus on is administrative stability. 
From the beginning, we have operated with limited and often volunteer administrative support, which has placed an unsustainable burden on board members. As our donor management and other needs grow, uh, strong administrative support is essential to support those needs and provide continuity as board positions turn over. We are seeing the limitations of an all-volunteer army. Our goal this year is to stabilize administrative support and put in place the skills that will enable us to continue growing uh, our fundraising efforts. We celebrate the successes we have achieved, but recognize there is much to do to sustain the foundation over the long term. We believe we have, identif have identified the right building blocks to ensure the foundation's capacity to support innovation in our schools. So on behalf of the foundation's board of directors, I thank the school board and the school division for your support and cooperation in helping the foundation achieve its goals. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Are there any questions or comments for Mr. Wilson? Mm -hmm. Mr. Kelly? <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. I think I think one of the most, you know, having been on this board when we were struggling to find a foundation and get it started and, and uh, to see what it's become, I think one of the most important things that this foundation has given this school system is enthusiasm. Uh, enthusiasm amongst the donors and, the, and uh, the supporters of the foundation, enthusiasm from the teachers who get the, who get this relatively minor amount of money, but it just excites them that they've written a proposal and got and received the grant award and and they and they're very excited so I, I just um, I really appreciate that uh, the reception at the muse at the museum the, Mar the Muscarelle Museum that we had excitement throughout uh, um, the the uh, grant recipients who were presenting their their um, awards or what they did with the money I thought was just was just wonderful and um, I haven't missed yet uh, opportunity to go and we give the grants and I'm not going to miss it again this year so uh, I think it's just uh, it's just exciting to be in the schools and to see the, the excitement that comes from the schools so uh, I just want to um, thank the board and, and and specifically thank you Clarence for for your involvement this this would not be what it is without your investment in this uh, from a personal and reputation standpoint um, I think uh, I think the world of you and, and what you've done with this, with this for the for this community, and uh, and to this being a part of it. So thank you, Mr. Wilson. I'd like to echo Mr. Kelly's uh, thanks, and and it's just uh, the thing I like about uh, that I think is most uh, impressive about the work that you do is that every time I tour a school. Um, and I'm walking through a hallway, a teacher will stick a head out of the doorway and say, come, come see what the foundation funded. And so there's a lot of buzz and excitement, and, and you're putting money directly into the teacher's hands, which goes directly to the students that, that we all here in this room aim to serve. So so thank you for that. There are no other co Oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Young. I, I, I did want to echo one thing that you said, Mr. Uh, Mr. Wilson. Is, it was really wonderful when you had the reception at the Mesquerel Museum to have those reps with their projects and everything that that was truly exciting and it was fun to watch uh, the momentum build as they presented because people were nodding and you could see that there was a lot of excitement among uh, the attendees about how their money was being used so thank you very much for your your hard work um, if there are no other comments or questions then uh, I will it's been moved and seconded thank you for the reminder mr. Kelly sirs if you'd call the roll please Ms. Ownby. Aye. Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Thank you again, Mr. Wilson. Um, that brings us to 9.02 VSBA Code of Conduct for School Board Members. May I have a motion, please? Madam Chair, I move that we uh, accept or approve the VSBA Code of Conduct for School Board Members. Is there a second, please? Second. Comments or discussion? Questions? Okay. It's been moved and seconded. Ms. Serza, will you call the roll, please? Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Ownby? Aye. Mrs. Taylor? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. Okay, the motion passes. That brings us to item 10.01, the WJCC School Health Initiative Program update. Before I um, ask Dr. Heron to take it over, I would like to first, just in the interest of full disclosure, 
comment that uh, the SHIP grant, School Health Initiative grant, is funded by the organization for which I work, the Williamsburg Health Foundation. And here in the room we have one of our board members, Mr. Clarence Wilson, and the president and CEO of the organization, uh, Ms. Jean Zeidler, is here, uh, as well as the program officer for the grant, one of my colleagues, Mr. Bill Pribble, and our fellow colleagues, uh, Paulette Parker and Allison Brody. So I just wanted to welcome all of you and thank you for being here. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, you beat me to it. I wanted to welcome all of our guests this evening, and, and especially Ms. Seidler. And the whole foundation, I don't, I don't think you realize just how much you have brought to our school system. I've been here for six years now, and every year I see a difference beginning to happen in the lives of our students and teachers and the healthy lifestyles that are being adopted because of the SHIP program. And I know we've got all of our staff here this evening as well, and I wanted to, say, to give a shout out to them as well. And at this point, I'd like to invite Dr. Lazef to come and present an update on the School Health Initiative Program. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the school board, and Dr. Heron. It's a pleasure to be here this evening to share updates from the School Health Initiative Program with you. SHIP is a partnership between the school division and the Williamsburg Health Foundation. This program began in 2005 with an 18-month planning grant and began implementation in 2006. We are funded yearly with the mission of improving the health and wellness of our students and community through the promotion of healthy eating and an active lifestyle. There is a very strong connection between health and education. Research shows that education is the single greatest social determinant of health. And in turn, health and health-related behaviors such as healthy eating and physical activity, have a significant impact on learning. The Williamsburg Health Foundation and the WJCC School Division have been on the forefront of recognizing this reciprocal relationship and working together to achieve the goal of creating an educated and healthy community. Together, we have created a data-driven program which uses both national and local data to drive our strategic plan and decision-making. While national data guides our understanding of the connections between healthy behaviors, educational attainment, and health, and how we can successfully achieve these goals, local data, collected in partnership with the College of William and & Mary and funded by the Williamsburg Health Foundation, allows us to see what the key local issues are and allows us to have a finger on the pulse of what is happening in our community. We also use outcomes data to examine specific aspects of our program and our success in both implementation and behavior change. This helps us see what is working and what is not, and what changes we may need to make to improve the program. While our program began in response to concerns about the national childhood obesity epidemic, we focus on the behaviors of healthy eating and physical activity, as research clearly shows they significantly contribute to obesity, along with a host of other related and important health concerns. These behaviors also significantly impact learning in the classroom, with national data showing that proper nourishment and physical activity increase attention and memory and engagement in learning. This slide shows our local data in the very first column, which is collected by William and Mary every three years. When we look at how we are doing compared to students across Virginia, shown in the second column, and the United States, shown in the third column, we can see that we're doing quite well. However, we would like to see these numbers increase with the ideal being 100% of our students meeting our um, healthy eating and physical activity goals. In addition to looking at overall numbers, we also look to see if there are demographic differences. Similar to national data, we see that there are in fact disparities, with our lower income students reporting poorer health and health behaviors on many important variables. 
As a result, equity issues are always on the forefront of our planning. We need to make sure all of our students can be part of the program and it is meeting their needs. This means making the program accessible to all with no burden in terms of cost, transportation, or resources needed to participate. This allows everyone to be at the table and no one is left out of the game. Part of creating equity is considering behavior change in its entirety. We know that creating healthy behaviors is not simple and there are many barriers. Using this effective promotion of health and wellness model, we seek to first educate our students so they know what the healthy choice is and have the skills needed to participate in healthy activities. Then moving around the circle, provide access to make healthy choices followed by motivating our students to want to make those healthy choices and rewarding and reinforcing when they do make the healthy choice. Finally, we sustain change by changing the environment and eliminating barriers and creating supports. We work in the classrooms, cafeterias, throughout the school with school-wide programming and after school, both at school and through parent and community outreach. We focus on our younger students where we can have the highest impact on the formation and development of healthy habits. We start in the classroom with teacher training and resources. We use active lessons, movement breaks, and kinesthetic learning to increase physical activity throughout the day and create active learning. We provide resources for the classroom, such as stability balls, bouncy bands, and wiggle seats, and create station rotations and indoor recess kits. We also provide professional development to classroom teachers. Collaborating with other departments, such as OT and PT and Bright Beginnings, we target and tailor our program to meet the needs of all of our students. And we have a video for you that will give you a look at what our wellness integration program looks like in our schools. As a wellness integration specialist, my job is to uh, show teachers how to incorporate physical activity into their academic lessons. I teach a variety of lessons with physical activity. We do anything <coughs> from relay races where they are classifying or sorting, um, to tagging games where they are peer assessing each other. There are scoot activities, station rotations that can be used for math, science, social studies, language arts, and kids are constantly moving and they're working on their academic content at the same time. My position has grown from me being by myself, one teacher, one school, to now three teachers over nine schools where Tons of teachers have been exposed to how to incorporate physical activity into their classroom. Okay, wellness integration has been very successful. We have grown the program from one school to all nine elementary schools. 79% of our elementary classroom teachers now report using active lessons or movement breaks at least once a week. And only 6% report rarely using them. Um, there has also been an increase in the use of alternative seating and classroom design to keep our students active. Interest in activity integration has increased. For example, we're now collaborating with a program called Ready Bodies Learning Minds, which is targeted to our youngest students in Bright Beginnings and Kindergarten, ensuring that they are active and develop the physical skills needed to be ready to learn. Since there are limits to how much activity we can add into the academic day, we also use the after school time. Challenge clubs allow our students to try new activities and develop interests, skills, and passions for lifelong physical activity. Clubs include classic physical activities like kickball, dodgeball, jump rope, so students can learn the skills and can do so safely on their own. We even partner with our Safe Routes to School program for a bike safety club.
We also have activities that students may not have access to due to cost and transportation barriers. Dance, ballet, jazz, and step, sports such as soccer, basketball, volleyball, and cheerleading. Some of our community partners who help teach those um, also offer scholarships following student involvement in the clubs. We include clubs which also teach discipline and wellness like martial arts and yoga and some clubs that are just unique and fun like our ninja warrior clubs, a favorite in our middle school. In all of our clubs, our goal is for students to have fun, love being active, so that they continue to do so. This next video, oh, sorry, this next video um, will give you a closer look at our clubs. Challenge clubs are after school activities for our students here in WJCC, which give these students the opportunity to try new activities and develop new skills and lifelong healthy habits. Clubs are open to students starting in the third grade. Students are provided with a healthy snack and transportation home, all at no cost to the student. Currently, we offer over 60 different clubs across 15 schools. Clubs include all kinds of physical activity. We also have cooking and gardening clubs. When students have the opportunity to garden, they gain an understanding of where their food comes from and make healthier choices. Some of our cafeterias have even served the food grown in our garden clubs. Every club has a WJCC staff sponsor and an instructor who is either a staff member or a community partner. In all of our challenge clubs, students set goals and work to gain the skills and persistence they need to accomplish their goals. For example, our running clubs all participate in a 5K run as their culminating event. The Sleigh Bell 5K and the Run the Dog 5K are highlights for our community. These races have grown from just a few students participating to over 600 students, staff, and family members coming together to reach their goals. Above all, Challenge Clubs bring our students together, creating a healthy school community for all. As you'll see in this slide, our participation numbers in clubs have increased dramatically over the course of our program. Clubs level the playing field, allowing everyone to be part of the action, creating a healthy community. In addition to the direct benefit of clubs, clubs also provide excitement to come to school on club days, increasing attendance, uh, improve feelings of belonging in the schools, increase a positive relationship between students, teachers, and their peers, and create a sense of community with the foundation of that community being built on health and wellness. We want to thank our WJCC Transportation Department who provides access to our students through our bus routes home after our clubs, and our Child Nutrition Services Department who provides a healthy snack and partners with us to provide our cooking clubs. In addition to physical activity, we also focus on teaching nutrition and increasing healthy eating behaviors. SHIP Wellness Integration Specialists taught 630 lessons across 90 classrooms this past year for kindergarten, first, and second grade nutrition. To go back to our model of change, we know that it's not enough just to educate. And we know that parents struggle to get their children to eat healthy foods. In collaboration with William and Mary, we surveyed our parents for our elementary school students. We asked parents what their biggest challenges were in getting their children to eat healthy food. The top answers were, my child does not like vegetables. My child does not like eating healthy foods. And healthy foods are just too expensive. Struggling with your child over eating vegetables and spending money on food um, that they do not eat can create quite a challenge for our parents. In fact, research shows that when parents are concerned with costs and waste, they will stick to familiar foods and eat less healthy foods. That's why the French fry is the most common vegetable eaten by children in the United States. Access to healthy foods and motivation to try them, therefore, is crucial. 
Our partnership with Child Nutrition Services is uniquely positioned to help solve this problem. Our ship dietitian and consulting chef collaborate and provide culinary training, recipe development, menu planning and presentation, and a farm to school program. After learning about the importance of healthy foods in our nutrition classroom lessons, students are given the access, opportunity, and reinforcement to try healthy foods in our cafeterias. This is crucial to all of our students, but especially those who are on free and reduced lunch who rely on school food. We currently have 36% of our WJCC population uh, as part of our free and reduced lunch program. This is a growing issue. Back in 2007, the overall rate for the whole division was 21%, and there were 2,230 students on free and reduced lunch. This year, there are 4,283 students on free and reduced lunch. Our goal, therefore, is to bring everyone to the table, creating a community of healthy eaters. As part of the CNS partnership and farm to school program, we have begun to do tastings, and we have a video to show you more about those. I want to take a moment to thank Child Nutrition Services. Um, their partnership is crucial for these tastings. They do a lot of extra work in terms of bringing in local foods that are healthy and prepping them for us. So we are very grateful for this partnership in making this program possible. So we have a video that shows you a little bit more about our farm to school tastings in our schools. I'm Jessica Christman. I'm a wellness integration specialist with the SHIP program. In addition to our nutrition lessons and physical activity in the classroom, we also extend into the cafeteria. About twice a month, the schools have locally grown vegetables for the farm to school program. The farm to school tastings at the schools are a really great opportunity for the students to try something new because when all their peers are trying a new vegetable, it really encourages them to try the vegetable as well. When the students have an opportunity to taste the food before going through the line, they're more likely to order it. The fact that they earn a sticker for trying something new is also really exciting and a great way for them to share what they've tried with their families once they get home. My favorite vegetable that we tried is butternut squash because it's so sweet and tasty. Lots of parents have reported that their kids were really excited about the kale chips or the spaghetti squash that they tried in the cafeteria, so the families were looking for fun ways to incorporate it with their dinners at home. Even the staff members at the school really love the farm to school tastings. They always try the food alongside with the kids and really encourage their students to try something new as well. Farm to school program is a really good program because it really teaches children to eat healthy and especially uh, when they bake and uh, use uh, very healthy natural ingredients and this is really awesome. I hope that they come more often here. We really appreciate the collaboration with Child Nutrition Services and the cafeteria managers working with our dietitian and our school chef. They've come up with some really awesome recipes that the students seem to love. These farm to school tastings really change the eating habits of our students and even the staff. So going back to our model of change, we can look at every aspect and see how we're doing. For education, we see that when students receive the nutrition lessons in the classroom, their pre to post scores increased uh, by 32 points last year. On at providing access, one example of this would be in our farm to school program, um, CNS has increased the purchase of locally grown vegetables by 30% over the past year. Um, just to give you a sense of the magnitude of that, they went from, in 2015-16, um, serving 6,240 pounds of locally grown fresh vegetables to last year serving 8,125 pounds. So a real significant increase. 
Um, for motivating and rewarding, um, this year we've already done 15 tastings in our schools. Uh, we also have available on our website eight different videos with the recipes developed that CNS is now using for these locally grown vegetables so parents can try them at home. And we do hear reports from parents that they are, in fact, trying recipes, with favorites being the kale chips. Uh, sustainability. Uh, we've surveyed parents to see uh, their satisfaction with our changes, working with our cafeterias, and we saw a 40% increase, uh, I'm sorry, 40% of parents reported an, an increase in their satisfaction with uh, the food in the cafeterias. So while we are pleased with the results we are getting, this is an ongoing project and we continue to grow the program, increasing participation and addressing the needs of the community. WJCC is leading the way across the state. SHIP has served as a model for other school divisions across Virginia who are starting and basing their programs on ours. Our plan for the future is to continue to eliminate barriers to health create equity and health for all of our students, and continue to grow our parent and community partnerships, leveraging the skills and resources in our community. When we come together to create healthy schools, we create a healthy community which supports readiness to learn, success in education, and lifelong health. We could not accomplish this without the partnership with the Williamsburg's Health Foundation under the leadership of Jean Zeidler. We greatly appreciate this partnership and support. I'd also like to thank our amazing ship staff who are here today um, and the collaboration of CNS and transportation departments. Uh, additionally, our teachers and administrators in the school are such an important part of this collaboration because they're the ones implementing and bringing what we're uh, training them on into the classrooms on a daily basis. So we are very grateful for their collaboration. Um, it takes a village, not just within the schools, but within the community. And this slide gives you um, a listing of just some of our community partners that we're currently working with that help make this program possible. So we encourage you to follow us on social media to get a day-by-day -day look at our program. And we welcome you to come visit our classrooms to see our active lessons and nutrition lessons. Come have lunch and try our farm-to-school veggies, our chef's specials, or a breakfast smoothie. And visit our challenge clubs and learn a new skill or run in the next 5K. April 21st is our next one with the Run the Dog 5K. We encourage you to come out and give it a try. Thank you, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you, Dr. Lazo. Does anyone have anything, any questions? I, I have no questions, but I, but, um, I do have several comments. Uh, SHIP is such a great asset for our community. Um, for our school system. It's a great resource for our teachers. Um, it's the, the, the excitement that SHIP generates amongst the kids for eating healthy and for, for making healthy choices I, I think is amazing. And I think it's great that it's a model program that's being copied across the state. It's, uh, um, and as big of a fan as I am of SHIP, I am not the biggest fan of my household. So I can, ass I can assure you of that. Um, but one thing I think I think the community needs to also understand too is as valuable a program as this is to us, um, as many offerings and as much programs as there, it's not a line item in our budget. It uh, doesn't cost the taxpayer a thing, even as valuable as it is. Um, and I think I just want to thank the Williamsburg Health Foundation for their support and um, and uh, of, the, of the ship program and, and the, what the asset it is for our community and our school system. It's just a, it's just a wonderful thing. So thank you. Just like to echo, this is ship is impressive at so many levels from the challenge clubs, and I, my youngest has participated in the after school challenge clubs for years and thoroughly enjoyed each and every one of them. 
um, from the integrative specialist. I enjoy when I go visit classrooms to see the flexible seating and with every school I visit there's more and more of that and I think that's a huge impact. Um, but for me probably one of the one of the more impressive things but again everything is impressive are the community partnerships. I mean that's just amazing the list of community partners that are engaged in working with our school division. So thank you for um, making that happen. Thank you. Just want to thank again the foundation for your incredible support and, and Ms. Eidler for your leadership over the number of years you've been there. I know we're going to miss your leadership in the organization as well, but we really appreciate everything you've done and, and the incredible amount of resources you've provided to us as a school system. Thank you very much. So I can count on all of you to run the dog with me this April, <laughs> right? Yeah? yeah. <laughs> all right. I'll give you a dog. <laughs> We can run with the mascots, right, Ms. Hong? Yeah. Okay. Oh, well, it starts well, out if I'm up there. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Lazov, and thanks, thanks to all of you for being here. That brings us to uh, item 10.02, Equity Through Engagement, the Learning Lab. Dr. Heron? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm pleased this evening to introduce uh, Dr. Nev, who's going to talk about our learning lab. This continues our equity through engagement, where we're bringing information to the board and the public about the many things, programs that we have that are serving uh, students within our school community. Dr. Nev, thank you for being thank here. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, and Dr. Heron. Thank you for the opportunity to present to you this evening as part of the Equity Series presentations. On behalf of the Office of Student Services, I will share information about our high school non-traditional program called the Learning Lab, along with some data points that demonstrate how the Learning Lab helps keep students on track toward graduation who may otherwise fall behind. The Student Services Department provides different learning formats for students who are unable to attend their assigned school due to medical, emotional, or behavioral reasons. Prior to the opening of the Learning Lab, these learning options were very limited, but included placement at Enterprise Academy and homebound or home-based instruction. While Enterprise Academy is an appropriate placement for only a small number of students based on serious disciplinary incidents, the majority of the students in need of a different learning option accessed homebound and home-based services. As the number of students in need of a different setting increased, it became more difficult to meet the demand. The Learning Lab opened in the spring semester of 2015 as a pilot program and has now become a full-time resource to meet the individual instructional needs of students. While non-traditional programs operate differently across the nation, there are some identified characteristics of effective programs. These characteristics include providing instruction in a learning environment that is not like traditional school, providing one-on-one -on -one support for students, employing a staff with an underlying philosophy of acceptance and who have the ability to build meaningful relationships with students, and helping students make connections to the future. High school completion can be accessible to students who are not successful in traditional school settings by providing a separate nurturing environment, an accessible curriculum, support with content and emotional needs, and an accepting staff. Because this atmosphere is so different from what students are used to, most students are willing to give school another chance. This slide illustrates the theory by which the program operates. In terms of short and long-term goals, the Learning Lab strives to keep students on track to graduate on time by earning their usual four credits per semester and passing any end-of-course tests. When the program began, we followed the traditional model of having students take four courses each semester. We quickly learned that juggling four online courses was challenging for students, and we adjusted the format to include having students complete two courses each nine weeks. The result is the same, but having to manage only two courses at a time keeps it manageable for students. This year we're monitoring when students enter the program and we're making further adjustments to include offering semester-long courses if needed. Last year we had an 85% completion rate for all of our courses. The Learning Lab is an instructional option for students who are unable to access or achieve success in the regular school setting. The program operates on an abbreviated schedule, offering two sessions from which students may choose. Either the morning session, which meets from 9 to 12 Monday through Thursday and 9 to 11 on Friday, or the afternoon session, which meets from 1 to 4.30 Monday through Thursday. There are currently 20 spaces available per session. 
This is based on the success that we've found keeping the student to teacher ratio around 10 to 1. Students in the learning lab take coursework online under the supervision of two teachers and a part-time counselor in the lab. This year we're using the two teachers to deliver blended instruction for English and math courses. This means that the students continue working online, but the teachers are able to offer more targeted instruction when students struggle with concepts. The teachers are offering learning stations in addition to individual support. However, instruction in the learning lab does not look one way. It takes the form of whatever each student needs to be successful. The Learning Lab is currently located in the Annex, or 900 building, on the campus of Lafayette High School. As the Learning Lab was being developed, the program that was previously in the Annex closed, leaving some space vacant. We repurposed a room in the Annex for the program and have since learned just how well the function of that location works. Having the exterior entrance, the bus loop, and the central location of the program all feed into the success of the program for all, th all three high school students. Coming to the Learning Lab can be done through an, a referral from a school counselor, an administrator, or a parent, or through the disciplinary hearing process. Many of the students served in the Learning Lab are dealing with social-emotional issues, such as anxiety, that made the traditional setting difficult to navigate, and for whom without this option would most likely pursue homebound services. Other students have accessed the Learning Lab because they have become disengaged from school and are at risk of dropping out, or they may have been long-term suspended from school. Based on the established climate in the Learning Lab, all of the students we have served have found some form of success, and I would like to point out that in over two years, we've only had one disciplinary incident. To help illustrate just how creative we can be with individual needs, I would like to share the story of one student who came to the lab who was considering being homeschooled. After we met to enroll the student, he decided he wanted to participate in a sport. We worked with the zoned school to create a hybrid schedule of one school-based course along with the learning lab courses so that the student could be eligible to participate. By creating a unique schedule to meet this student's needs, he continued to do that format and he was able to earn additional credits and he actually graduated early. Here is the perspective of a current student who came to the learning lab through a counselor referral. What the Learning Lab has meant to me, it's, it's changed my life dramatically. I like how everything is just right there where you need it, when you need it. I really like the location that it's at right now and I really enjoy coming to school every day. <laughs> I thought it was going to be boring, I thought I was going to have a terrible time focusing by myself and then it well exceeded my expectations. I come in here every day, smile on my face. I don't feel the need to like pretend that I'm sick so I don't have to come in. I Everything's just changed and I love it and it's just changed a lot about my attitude on going to college and um, what I want to do with my life. Other student perspectives are quoted here, and as you read through these, you will see that one theme that students in the Learning Lab maintain is a lack of distraction. Another point that the students like to make is the level of connectedness to the program, which is ultimately affecting graduation rates. I'm happy to share with you some numbers from the past two and a half years. Uh, this slide illustrates the number of students we've served by school. The Learning Lab has served a total of 85 Lafayette students, 53 Jamestown students, and 43 Warhill students to date. A total of 181 students have been served in the Learning Lab over the past two years, and this shows you the breakdown by semester and by school.
295 total credits have been earned, and there is the potential for well over 100 credits to be earned by the end of this semester. As you can see, and by the end of this semester, that last graph will go even higher, uh, we continue to push students to earn as many credits as they can. Once students come to the Learning Lab, we work with them toward their own intended outcome. Students typically want to graduate by finishing up whatever requirements they have left, return to their zone school, remain in the program, or sometimes the student and the family determine that a referral to the GED program may be appropriate. Finally, you see the SOL pass rate results by students in the Learning Lab. Last year, during first semester, during 16-17 semester one, you do see a dip, but that was our first year having a full-time program, and we had a brand new staff along with it. So there was a slight learning curve that went along with it, but by second semester, we got the results back up. This final video clip is of a school administrator and a school counselor discussing the impact of the learning lab on their students. Having a different building um, with different furniture from the regular desks just rams home that this is different. The expectation is going to be a little different. And there's going to be a little bit more responsibility put upon you when you take a look at the furniture in the room and it looks like an office. Um, it raises a, the expectation level there um, for students. I feel like from a counselor's perspective, having the learning lab for our students has been awesome. It's been wonderful. It, it gives these kids, especially our students who have social anxiety, um, it gives them a chance to complete their coursework, to come into class every day, and, to, and the fact that we have teachers out here working with them, I think has been wonderful. Lafayette's in a very special situation because it is housed right outside of our building. So we do have a couple of students who come into our building to take one class and then come to the learning lab to complete the rest of their classes. So we are allowing those kids to have a very flexible schedule, but it works. I think that, that statement right there, it works. Mm -hmm. For some students, we've tried to put interventions and, and, and things in place and plans in place and it wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. um, and this was another opportunity and it enabled some students to get a high school diploma and graduate on time um, whereas they may not have made that mark, mm -hmm. you know, any other way. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Questions from Dr. Nev? Ms. Ombi. Dr. Nev, so back a couple slides when we had options of graduating or GED, um, there was an other option? I'm just other, curious mm -hmm. what the other um, We've had some students that have moved out of the area or have enrolled in other programs or have decided not to continue their education. And then I just wanted to give, um, I think this is great. I, I think giving students um, options that, that best fit, um, meet their needs is wonderful. And I've spoken with at least one family whose child was ready to, to drop out um, in this individual is now on track to graduate. So I think it certainly is, is impacting our students. Kelly? Um, you, you mentioned earlier that you have 20 spots available. How many, how many students do you have, how many spots are taken? Uh, 20 are taken in the morning and about 18 in the afternoon right now. That's, that's great. And I, uh, the, stu the student teacher ratio I think is, is, is wonderful. And I think, I think just the whole premise of the program, meeting the kids where they are and what they need is really just exceptional. So uh, I thank you for this and thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Anything else? Dr. Nev, thank you very much for thank your you. good work and for coming to share it with us today. Sure. Thank you. That brings us to item 10.03 um, <coughs> middle school redistricting. We are in the home stretch. Um, so. So uh, right now we have before us two versions that we are considering and with the goal of voting on one of those two at our next meeting, the first meeting in February. So um, with that, Dr. Heron, would you like to? Thank you, Madam Chair. If you remember at the last meeting, the board um, 
asked to put two options out, map two and map four, for public comment. And we've got the uh, response to that to share with you tonight. And then if there's any specific questions about any of the information, obviously Mr. Leopold's not here tonight, but we can certainly provide those questions uh, to him. And this first slide, I believe, just uh, gives some background information on the whole process again. Um, key pieces of data. The survey, this second survey, was available for 10 days and had 240 responses uh, on maps two and, and maps <coughs> four. Um, this slide basically shows the response to the options, and as you'll see, they were really quite similar. One did not stand out beyond. The other, if you look at the two in blue and the two in the orangey red color, they're about they're they're well balanced. So you know we had a, a mix of community responses, some for two and some for four. And I think the preferred option was two, but again, 96 and 101 comments and, and voting on the preferred option was very very close. So really just uh, this is for the board's consideration as they continue their discussion and, and start to come to a decision about the fourth middle school, sorry, about rezoning all middle schools. All right. Um, does anyone have any questions uh, for Dr. Heron about um, what she just presented or the results of the survey or any comments about option two or option four? No? Well, yeah, okay. Ms. Yeah, sure. Um, I had wanted the feedback. I knew that it was only going to be for a short amount of time uh, because I, I wanted to read the comments that would come up and just see if there was something that I, I didn't realize about one option versus the other. Um, I found that it was interesting to me the comment about walking to schools. So that, when you look at option four, um, you've got the area of James Blair completely surrounded by blue, which would mean that you've got a nice uh, opportunity for those neighborhoods that are within walking distance of James Blair to actually be able to, to walk. Or um, it, it's just, we don't have that very often in our school system. We talk about um, ship, we talk about, uh, you know, accessibility to neighborhood schools and this and that, but the reality is that the majority of our students are going to be bused, and they just are. So it's really nice to me that we could actually have an option that would balance our schools the most and also give those neighborhoods the opportunity to walk to school should they want. So that to me, because when you look at option two, James Blair is right it's like right between James Blair and Berkeley. So you've got that school, and right across the street from that school, kids are going to Berkeley. So that, that comment, there were a couple comments about that, and that made an impression on me. I was a little, uh, I'm just throwing out my observations. I was um, concerned about, I think it was Newtown mentioned that there were maybe one or two kids that were... I don't, I don't know what the detail is on that, but that they were going to be the only few kids that were going to be redistricted. Do you know anything about that from what you were... That, that was kind of... I was like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know about that. I, I'm curious if that's different than now, because... I don't know. Right, right now... I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if it's different than it is now. Okay, yeah. so... I, I didn't know that. That was just one of those, ugh. Um, I, I think it's great that um, with option four, um, you've got a 10% difference in socioeconomic uh, breakdown. And when we were looking at high school redistricting and there was a lot of angst from, from parents, um, and I think 
everyone uh, liked the idea not everyone, obviously, but a lot of people like the idea of trying to balance our schools, but the reason for not doing the high schools, we, that resonated with the people that didn't want to do it, is that it wasn't, it, it, a new school wasn't being created that wasn't forcing redistricting to have to happen. And in this case, we do have a middle school that's coming online, and we are forced to redistrict. So why not take this moment and, and start everyone out as close to an even playing field as we can. So I, of the two options, I prefer option four for Tell those me. reasons. Sorry. Tell no. me. So I agree with a lot of what Ms. Hummel just said. The only, one of the concerns, however, I have about option four is that it increases um, utilization at Toano almost 10 points. So it goes to 87% versus 79, and I think most of the growth is going to be coming um, at that end of the county. So for that reason, I was leaning more towards two. Um, and I think I like the idea of, I mean, I like everything that Ms. Hummel just said, except except I like the utilization better in two. And I think two is, looks slightly more contiguous to me. Four. Yeah, go ahead, Ms. Army. Uh, just one more comment. This isn't exactly to the map, so maybe the chair or Dr. Heron can direct me as to when we can discuss this. I know mm -hmm. early on when we talked about redistricting, many parents um, wanted to know if there's an opportunity to look at busing and start times so with a new middle school coming online. So is there an opportunity to, mm -hmm. can, not, not high school start time, but, but you know, Tuano has always had the early start time. And originally, when that decision was made eons ago, that was supposed to be sh moved around and shared among all of the middle schools. Um, so, is there an opportunity to, to discuss start times and when? Not, not as a part of this. Okay. Um, before school starts. Well, uh, well. So, Dr. Heron gave us a list of strategic priorities, and that wasn't on that. So, I, I would say no. I, I, I think so what, 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 I wanted that, but I think I was the only one. So, so my question is: So when does so James Blair is on the second? When does it start? Once this decision is made, then we will look closely at the numbers and the schedule and see how many buses we need to do each version. So, once the decision is made about redistricting, it allows us to go in and start putting numbers into the system to see what's possible. Um, there's the possibility we'll have two middle schools on one tier and two on another. I don't see a lone school, but again, I don't want to say too much until we have the, the facts and run the numbers. Right, but so it's conceivable then that, that Tuano could possibly change. If we're, like, if we're going to continue to have a school or two schools on a different start time, that it could change. It, it all depends on the numbers. On logistics. Yeah, absolutely. But we'll, we'll run different scenarios and try to get some options and see what's going to work best for students. I thought you meant high school start. No, 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 that's not what I meant. Uh, Mr. No. Kelly? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I've always been a, a favor of option two. Start. Um, because it does, because if, if you take, if you take Tuano out, the, out of the equation, um, the other schools are with are within ten percent of on the the, the SES numbers, um, and then and leaves room for Tawano for growth at Tawano. Um, but then, as uh, struck by Mrs. Hummel's example of reading the comments, um, I, I I read one comment where it said people that were live next door to Tawano go to Hornsby, and I was and I went look at the maps, and I'm like, you're right, they do. Um, so I mean I don't know I don't know if it's too late in the game to kind of cut that off so that uh, uh, if there's five kids that live next to Tuano that they can actually go to Tuano versus being bus down Cranston Mill Pond Road to Hornsby. But um, um, in general, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a proponent of, I'm a proponent of uh, option two, but I would like to see that kind of cut off to to get. Them. We, we because, they, because they are, I mean, the, the, the point is valid. They are right next to Tawano, and they're going to Hornsby. And it's just, just, uh, uh, no. 
So I just, I just. We'll certainly take a look at that and the new town question as well to make sure to see what the actual circumstances are there. My, my question about new town was, would be: Is that any different? Because right now there's a right now there's a teeny tiny group of people who go to, from DJ to to Berkeley, and so if that's the same. Uh, but um, are there any other questions? Comments? The only comment I have is, um, I, I, after looking at the options, I prefer that we keep Tuana. It's an unknown at this point. We don't know what's going to happen in the northern part of the county. Um, and I prefer to give us some leeway there so that we're not redistricting sooner rather than later. And uh, so I, I prefer option number two for that reason. Anything else? So, in my thinking about the tension between balancing socioeconomic status and capacity, um, I uh, thought back to the conversation in 2014 about where to build a new middle school. And the city and the county worked diligently and created a map with an oval on where the next growth was coming. And it wasn't out in the Tuano area. And so I'm, I'm hearkening back to that 2014 map, and I know that Warhill has been hit hard, and I know Tawana is packed to the gills, um, and I know we see houses coming out of the ground there, and I know that any new construction is, who knows, because you don't know whether who's going to move in those houses, whether they're going to have children or not. But um, I would like a gut check, because um, there are consultants used to create these maps used Future Think which has been incredibly accurate in terms of the whole, but not necessarily the, the, at the micro level between schools. And I would like to see, I'd just like a gut check to see if that 2014 map um, and the, these projections, because it could be that Toano at 79% is too low. It could be that 87% is actually better, especially if we think back to that 2014 oval. Do you remember that oval, Jim? I do remember that oval. Yeah. Um, so I, if I have to choose between socioeconomic balance and capacity, I choose capacity, in which case I would choose option two. But I, I am taken by, um, I'm taken by the Toano comment and the walkability comment, and then also I just keep thinking about that 2014 map, and if our planners, if our local planners are, are telling us that the growth is basically around 199, um, should we not double check that before we vote? So I don't know what you all think about that. Yeah, the, if we go back to 2014, um, the growth was in the center of the county, and the growth has happened in Newtown. Mm -hmm. A lot of houses being built in Newtown, not a lot of kids. Um, Right. We have seen a lot of of, of um, family housing going up, went up in the upper end of the county, and so you know that's what mm -hmm. that's what brings them to War Hill. That's what brings them to Stonehouse. That's what brings them to Toano. And so, um, so while the the development has been in the center of the county, there's just a plethora of kids there. Right. Like we are, see we seem to be seeing in the upper end of the county, which is, seems to be more. Um, families up there versus uh, what's, what appears to be the demographic in Newtown. Uh -huh. But I would agree with you. A, a gut check of that would just be kind of uh, nice to have at this point. Uh, do we, do, does, a, does a county see anything different? And I think it's mostly a county question, right? Right. I mean, we see, we see a little bit in the city in the quarter path area and that kind of thing, but it's really like, it's really a county driver. Is it is it Newtown or is it Tawano or... So it would be interesting to get, get planning's com, uh, input on what they see there. We can certainly uh, send the question, see if they can add anything to the picture. In option four, of course, Hornsby is sitting at 80% as well, and it is, it is our biggest middle school. Right, and then when you think about a percentage of a larger school, there's more... more um, the difference between four and two in Tuano is 62 kids. Um, In a bigger school, that may not. 62 kids at James Blair would 
big a big a, be a bigger difference. So, is is it if everybody agrees? I don't want to. But I I, I, um, I think we've we've had several gut checks along the way. I really think I I I feel as if I have enough information. Uh, I, it's it's like every time we have a meeting, there's some other little twist that comes up, and well, then we're gonna um, I'm gonna need more information, and it goes on to the next meeting, and it's like, well, you know, that's another thing. Geez, you know, we I don't think you can just you know sooner or later, I won't use that expression. Um, you have to. Um, um, I can't use that expression either. either. <laughs> expression, Dr. Beards. What are you looking for? Make a decision. Make well, a you decision. have to face your cut bait. I guess <laughs> that, that one will work. I can work. Well, yes, so I just think because we've, really, we've spent hours, and I have, and I'm sure everybody else has, has spent hours and hours and hours um, going over this. And my assumption is that I think the chair, you know, I, th I th thought that's what I heard, is that we'll make a final decision at our next meeting. Am I wrong about that? Correct. What if you get information at the next meeting and it's like, oh, geez, I never thought about that. Well, I guess we'll have to put it off another. <laughs> I think, I just think we have, to me, I, I, I have enough information. I, I And I, um, Sure, I have misgivings about all of them, every one of them. But I, I am. Um, is there nothing? I'm, I'm, I'm supporting. I support option two. Is there, the one is there nothing? About. If, if um, information came to you between now and the next meeting, that would have um, different statistic there. Would you still vote for no option two? I don't so know it doesn't this, really matter I don't know, yeah, to you. Yeah, but I'm not sure where the statistic is going to come from. The county. I, I used to, um, and, and representatives and neighbors. I know the Board of Supervisors, they get calls from their neighborhoods. They know what's going on. And I just think um, we're, we're, the group, we're the group that has to make the decision. I'm not going to, sure, if you want to get more information, yeah, okay, and of course I'll look at it, but I, 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 I don't think there is enough compelling information to make me be on option two. I, th I think none of them are perfect. Somebody's going to be upset. Somebody's going to be happy. That's always the case with redistricting, but I, to me, option two is the least disruptive. That's my, that's my opinion. John, I um, just had a question about the the students that appeared at uh, War Hill. Do we know where they came from? Do we know what part of the county they came from? No, I think we did get some um, private school students, but that wouldn't have accounted for the extra seventy students. Dr. Carroll, I don't think we have any idea of where the students came from this year. And some, so were, some were actually 10th graders, I believe. Okay, I was just wondering if they had come from uh, up the Tawano area down to attend school at Warhill. I was, that, that was basically my question, but we don't know. That's the answer. Okay. So I think, to your point, Dr. Beers, I think a majority of this board is prepared to vote for option two. Um, but what's troubling me is the disconnect between previous research and this research. And I just, but I don't want to unilaterally task staff with checking into something. So I just wanted to pose that because it could be that 2014 is yesterday's news and it no longer applies. Um, but, it, but it does, I am thinking about it um, as it pertains to capacity the middle school. And I'm a Leo and I'm not a Libra, so that, that could also <laughs> be part of it. <laughs> Libras, yeah, they really, it's hard for them to make decisions. <laughs> it's okay. I'm a Libra. I know, I know, 
It's okay. It's all right. <laughs> Yes, Ms. I, I guess the, my, my one question, since <laughs> going back to what Mr. Kelly said about, about the oval, if, if, if that area around Newtown was the part that was being developed in 2014, which I assume from what I heard it, it, it was, but it did not produce students. That's what you were saying, right? Right, right. And so, I mean, it, will the county be able to tell us where students are coming from? I, I don't know, but it wasn't just Newtown. I mean, there's the area behind Kingswood. Is that you know, what's that called? Like Mary, whatever. So it wasn't yeah, just Mary Newtown. Or something, maybe. Yeah, but I, I don't know. It's not my profession. I'm just saying I remember the oval, right. and I remember it justified the location of the building we're about to open, and just about. Um, okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, so is everybody okay with that gut check? Yeah. Dr. Heron, can you just That's fine. check that? Sure, absolutely. And, I mean, I understand where Dr. Beers is coming from, and, and, and I, think, I think that would just be an, an interesting piece of data. But I think, like Dr. Beers, I'm not sure that I'm, it's going gonna, it's gonna to move me off of option two. Although I would like to see those kids next to Tawana go to Tawana. But I'd like to see the kids <laughs> right next to right. right next to Blair go to Blair. All right. Anything else on redistricting before we move on? So this will be on um, the work session agenda, the first meeting in uh, February as an action item, and we will take action on it because staff needs to get uh, working on. Uh, Mr. Snipes has a lot of work ahead. So, All right. That brings us to 11.01 .01, board members' comments and uh, requests. Ms. Young, do you have anything? Um, well, first of all, I just want to say how much I enjoyed the AXO um, luncheon. Um, I'm glad I checked my calendar. I would have been there the next morning. Um, and uh, appreciated the fact that uh, 12 students received um, recognition there from our schools, which I thought was amazing. I, I love the movers and shakers. I've already commented on that, but I think it's an outstanding publication. and. Uh, and I like butternut squash too. <laughs> so that's all I use. We'll get you a sticker. Thank you, know. you. <laughs> Dr. Beers. Yeah, I, just a couple of things. Um, uh, once again, I am um, uh, overwhelmed by this the continuing success um, in our schools, especially um, our high schools. I would commend you um, tomorrow evening. At uh, 5.30, the Lafayette and Warhill wrestling teams will be Schools duking it out um, at Warhill at uh, 5 o'clock, and I would encourage that. And that is followed by the boys' basketball team um, uh, against Grafton. School was canceled. God, is, are those going to be canceled? Yeah, they're canceled. Oh. After school activities are canceled. <laughs> I mean, we can't go at night. We ne next, no. time. Oh. next time. Well, it'll be, re it'll be so, rescheduled, okay. Dr. Bears. We All right. We'll do it. Cancel that. I'll have to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I got nothing else to say. Thank Dr. Bears, there's the Ram Rumble on Saturday. You what? The Ram Rumble on Saturday. If oh, okay. you want to see some wrestling. Yeah, the Ram Rumble? The Ram Rumble. Assuming we're back in school by then. Um, <laughs> Taylor, do you have anything? Um, just to thank you to the staff and my colleagues for their work on the budget retreat this afternoon and to the citizens who share their input. And stay safe tomorrow. This is my snow day reading material. So <laughs> <enjoy> that. <laughs> Mr. Kelly. You get to go. I know. I'm very excited about that. Um, I, 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 Dr. Beers, I do believe that it's, it's against the rules for wrestlers to duke it out. I think they, <laughs> I, I did wrestle a little bit when I was in high school, but anyway. Um, well, you had to be a wrestler. To I did wrestle. Um, I'd, like to, I'd like to add the movers and shakers presentation. I really, I really enjoyed that. I, I uh, thank, um, thank the students for coming out for that. And, uh, and uh, the excitement, I know her name's not Dr. Nunley anymore, but Dr. Nunley's excitement there. 
you got to write that down for me so I can remember that. Um, but I just enjoy her excitement and, um, and her love for Lafayette High School. I think that's great. Um, I would like to thank our operations team for the work that they're doing during the, they did in the recent weather event. Um, and uh, I appreciate uh, the uh, struggle of making snow decisions, Dr. Heron. I know that um, that, can, that can be tough, particularly when you get to the end of an event and it's like, okay, when do you send them back? And, and a lot of the roads are, are, are good, but there's several that are not. And uh, we don't need to see pictures of uh, school buses in um, ditches. So uh, um, I know how tough that is, and I appreciate, uh, I appreciate, I think what most I've got, feedback I've gotten is the early decisions that we've made and, and allowing, yeah, really allowing parents to, to uh, make plan, plan B for the school. So, uh, and... Uh, and we have another one coming, so uh, here we go. Yes, sir. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Ms. Hummel? Um, I just wanted to thank all the presenters tonight and also, once again, um, just voice my appreciation for the WJCC Foundation and the grants that they are giving to the schools and then to ship because, as um, Mr. Kelly said, all of those things that they do for us we don't have to vote on or prioritize in a budget session, which is just awesome. Uh, and I, I want to also thank um, thank the uh, Equity Through Engagement, the Learning Lab presentation. Uh, it's critical that we try to meet our kids wherever they are on their path, and uh, it takes a lot of work to do that. So I wanted to appreciate show my appreciation for that. And uh, I will make a decision on middle school redistricting one way or another <laughs> next. Because I'm a Libra. Well, you're it gonna takes look, a little time. Look at the data, too. That's <laughs> right. Thank you, Ms. Hummel. Hey, I'm surrounded, my family, I am surrounded by <laughs> Libras. And yes. just to decide what movie to go see, you can um, take yeah, so hours. Yes, Mr. Kelly still what I was going to talk about. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> So I just, Finally. I know, so but I just have to fair. echo his comments about Snowmageddon and um, appreciate operation staff and all that you did um, and, and making those tough decisions. Um, I'm excited to attend VSBA next week, I'm eager to meet with our legislators, to talk about what's happening here in Williamsburg, particularly interested in learning about um, proposed legislation. I know two of our local um, um, politicians, Pogi and Mullen, have proposed education legislation, so I'm eager to learn about that and what that will look like. Um, I'm sorry that I missed AXO. I really wanted to attend that. My daughter and I were touring colleges. But I'm glad that each of our schools celebrate Black History Month, African American Awareness Month um, in their unique way. And each school is very different. And so um, I like to hear how each school is recognizing that. And so I appreciate that. And wanted to thank all of our speakers who are actively engaged in our budget process. Tough decisions do have to be made and encourage the community to, to stay involved and understand the importance of investing in our schools. Our schools are not a liability, um, something to, to invest in because it impacts each and every one of us. Thank you. Um, I'd like to echo everyone's thanks to the operations team in the uh, past and future regarding weather events. So thank you very much, Mr. Snipes. If you could convey our collective thanks to your team, we would be really grateful. And also, I just wanted to, uh, I just think our students that were honored at the AXO breakfast were better than all the others. <laughs> and um, we just have amazing students. And the others were great too, but ours were just better. And then um, with regard to the upcoming budget, both at the state level and at the local levels, um, I do appreciate everybody's input on that. Uh, um, everyone on this dais, the staff, all the hard work that goes to even getting it to this point is, is really appreciated. But I think um, if we are going to submit a budget of need, um, that a budget of need is going to require advocacy, um, both at the state level and the local level, not only on our part, but everybody's part. So I hope that that is something that um, people are willing and able to engage in as we continue to inv invest in um, the children of this community. Is there anything else? Yes, Ms. The only thing I wanted to say is that I hope that at some point while I'm on this board that when we have our budget retreat that we'll see JROTC as one of the line items that we need to, to uh, fund.
That moves us to 12.01 upcoming events. And on the 22nd and 23rd of January in Richmond, the Virginia School Board Association is hosting its capital conference. And then on the 23rd of January, and also in Richmond, the VSBA is uh, hosting orientation for new uh, chairs and vice chairs. So uh, Zone B will be uh, attending that. On the 17th of January, the Student Advisory Committee is meeting at 3 o'clock at Jamestown High School. Uh, the Policy Committee is meeting on the 24th of January. What? It's in cancel. At 8 a.m. Uh, in the annex at the school board office. And then VSBA board training, we're all participating in in Charlottesville on the 26th uh, at 10 a.m. And that brings us to upcoming meetings. Our next meeting is the 6th of February uh, at the Annex and the School Board offices at James Blair, followed by work session and action items at 6.30. Uh, that's where we will take um, a vote on districting middle school, as we've said previously this evening. And then our meeting, second meeting in February is on the 20th of February at 6 p.m. Uh, and uh, at the county. So let's not forget that. Building F on Mounts Bay Road and then followed by a regular meeting at 6.30. So we're all gonna remember next month to show up James City County. So if there's nothing else, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>